Hello and welcome to our final In Conversation episode three. I'm Lydia Miller, Executive Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts of the Australia Council for the Arts. We acknowledge the Camaragal lands of the Eora Nation and all the lands throughout this beautiful country where all of you are joining us from. We acknowledge the First Nations people and honour their elders past and present and respect their deep enduring connection to lands, waterways and surrounding clan groups since time immemorial. This is the third episode in our new series In Conversation with the Australia Council. Over the last week, we've been joined by George Megalogenis, who chatted with my colleague Wendy Weir, around the economic impacts of culture and creativity, the impacts on productivity, inclusivity, rebuilding and recovery. In our second episode with Georgie Harmon, CEO of Beyond Blue, and Adrian Collette, CEO of the Australia Council, we discuss the importance of well-being and recovery as we rebuild our communities, environments and look to next year. This fundamental theme of recovery, rebuilding and being prepared economically, socially and personally leads us into this third and final conversation. We may touch on traumatic events in this conversation, so please take care of yourself as we explore some potentially difficult topics together. It's now my great pleasure to welcome my guest, Shane Fitzsimmons. Lydia, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity to have a chat. It's great that you can join us for this third and final episode, Shane. In May this year, Shane was appointed as the inaugural Commissioner for Resilience New South Wales and Deputy Secretary of Emergency Management with the Department of Premier and Cabinet. This appointment followed a distinguished career with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service of over 35 years, serving as both a volunteer and salaried member. Shane, thank you for joining us as part of this conversation. And I just want to say, I've heard you described as the nation's father. It must have been an extraordinary event in relation to how you navigated the past year. Would you like to tell us what that meant for you personally? Oh, Lydia, it, it, I think like so many uh, people across New South Wales uh, and further afield with these fires, uh, it was an awful year in so many ways. Um, a fire season, uh, the likes of which we've never seen before in New South Wales. Uh, a scale and a magnitude uh, and a tragic toll that we simply haven't seen. Uh, and what a lot of people forget is that the fires actually started uh, way back in, 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 in the middle of winter for New South Wales. We were averaging over a thousand fires a month during winter and then things just intensified as the months rolled on. And coming on the back of one of the worst droughts we've ever had in history, uh, the landscape was particularly dry. Um, there was a moisture deficit like never before. 100% of the state was drought affected or drought declared. Uh, and as we rolled into spring, and then as we rolled into, into summer, we just saw more and more fires take hold. Ultimately, we had uh, in the order of 12,000 fires across New South Wales. Mm. They burnt out an area of 5.5 million hectares. Uh, and the toll was extraordinary. Uh, the environmental damage, the cultural damage, uh, the damage to communities and livelihoods and primary producers and, and farmers uh, and families, uh, families and communities effectively from the Queensland border all the way down uh, to the Victorian border. Uh, and it started off very much in the north of the state earlier on in the season and went all the way through uh, until we saw the weather finally break. Uh, and the weather didn't break until we until we got that, that rainfall uh, in February. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, uh, month after month, uh, the outlook was just for more above average temperatures and below average rainfall. For me personally, like, like so many in New South Wales, as difficult and as traumatic as the season was, uh, there was also this extraordinary uh, sense of pride uh, in, in, the, in the workforce, in the, in the men and women that were committing themselves day after day, week after week, month after month. We were averaging anywhere from two and a half up to nearly 5,000 people per shift day and night. Mm. Uh, and, and these were people working to protect their community. Uh, and as we saw, communities much further afield because those firefighters and those emergency services personnel, the vast majority of whom are volunteers doing it for nothing, uh, other than the want to make a difference in their community was, was quite remarkable. And, and we ended up having 
six and a half thousand people from every state of Australia, every state and territory of Australia, United States, Canada and New Zealand come to our aid and we needed it. We've never seen damage and destruction like it. Those 5.5 million hectares, nearly two and a half thousand homes destroyed, all sorts of other community infrastructure, environmental damage. But I think the biggest thing that took its toll for me, undoubtedly, would have been the 26 lives lost. Uh, we lost two lives in November, seven in December, five in, in um, sorry, two in um, October, seven in November, five in December, and then 12 in January. And, and 26 lives was, was awfully tragic, uh, but seven of those lives were firefighters. There were mm. four volunteer firefighters uh, and three air crew uh, that paid the ultimate price while they were out serving and protecting their community. So absolutely it was a season of tragedy, extraordinary trauma. I think it's changed the lives of people forever. It's certainly changed my life forever, the way I reflect and think about things. And, and I think it told us um, in, a very, in a very sobering way um, um, the reminder of the fragility of life. We shouldn't take for granted that the tomorrow will come because we've seen droughts, bushfires, then storms and floods and now COVID. We've all had a really, really difficult period uh, when you look at the last 12 or 18 months. I think that's a great starting point and it gives us a context for where we are now and I think there's a lot of lessons that have been learnt and we're going to explore that further in the session. I think in, in respect to your admirable leadership that really enabled all of us as a community to feel safe, assured and able to respond, uh, even if we weren't in those communities, to actually bring together this nation because these were the things that mattered to us most and it was our humanity. So Absolutely. And, and, and for me, Lydia, I think you're right, uh, even though I had a role to play, I, I, I had a role in an extraordinary team, a, a, a team mm. of a size and, size and scale and complexity like we've never had before. So. I did my job the very best I could because I knew I was relying on everybody else to do exactly the same thing. And, and every one of those press conferences, every one of those media events that we, we went to, I, I tried to think of two broad audiences all the time. The remarkable men and women that were out there on the front line, behind the scenes, in control centres, doing their very best to save and protect everybody, them and their families and loved ones. And then of course the second broad audience uh, were all the men and women, the communities that were impacted, affected or being threatened by these fires and every day as honestly as we possibly could uh, while still being respectful and very sensitive to what was what was unfolding, um, providing honest and clear updates as accurately as we could, clear advice about what we were doing but also what we weren't doing and why we could or couldn't do those sorts of things, uh, what we were expecting given the weather and the conditions but then most importantly what we wanted people to do, what we wanted people in those communities to do and they did, they made extraordinary decisions, difficult decisions, but decisions that went to the heart of helping to save lives and, and save property. And, and for that, I'll be forever grateful. Mm. I think it's an extraordinary experience that ultimately has resulted in what we're going to come up to. And I really want to talk about the fact that you're heading the Resilience yes. New South Wales. But Firstly, we asked the audience to join us in our conversation too, so I'm, I'm really keen to wind in some of these questions. So if we go to our question from our audience member, Diego Cruz in Sydney. The Australia Council has had a resilience fund and this panel involves the head of the Resilience Commission. Every sentence for the last eight months seems to have called on us to be resilient. But what does it really mean? What is resilience now? That's a great question. There are many different definitions of resilience. And I guess at a human level, as well as a system level or an institutional level, what have you found to be the, really the application of resilience? How can we understand what resilience means? It is a great question. And, and taking on this new role, I must admit, when, when I first looked at taking on the new role as Commissioner of Resilience New South Wales, it was going to be Commissioner of, of disaster and emergency management and recovery. And when they introduced the word resilience, I said, what's this word resilience? No one's going to resonate with the word resilience. No one will know what it means. Well, I've had to eat humble pie because in, in the last six months of having the role, 
everyone's got a view on resilience and it really matters and and I think whether it's at the individual level whether it's at the family level uh, whether it's business or community level ultimately there's slight variations on the definition but it all comes back to the same sort of thing in my experience and that is it's how do we anticipate and ready ourselves uh, for times of challenge for disruption for for emergencies for for sadness for tragedy for uncertain times and boy haven't we had some uh, in the last uh, in the last 18 months, mm. but once we ready ourselves or prepare ourselves, what does that mean? First, we've got to personalise our own vulnerability and our susceptibility uh, to disruption. Then, most importantly, we've got to try and do something about that. So, how do we prepare ourselves individually? Uh, we have conversations, we share insights, we share we share thoughts and feelings, but we do things like have plans and have ideas and conversations around what are we going to do in the event that we're affected or we're disrupted. Obviously, we want to respond and deal with that event as best we can, but coming out the other side, uh, this word recovery, uh, recovery, rebuilding, repair, reconstruction, but healing. Healing is just, is, is so extraordinary given what we've been through. And for a lot of our communities, it's not just been the bushfires, it's not just been COVID. For many of them, it's been droughts and bushfires and storms and floods and COVID. And for some of them, it's all four of those things, let alone whatever else is going on in their life. For other communities, it might only be one or two of them, but they're really big, significant disruptions. And coming out the other side in that recovery and healing journey, how do we make sure we come out better and stronger uh, for the experience so we can ready ourselves and be pre better prepared and better invested next time around uh, we see something affect us or, or disrupt us in an adverse way. Uh, Resilience New South Wales is the uh, lead disaster management agency for New South Wales. You are responsible for all aspects of disaster recovery and building community resilience for future disasters. So you have a focus on social, economic, infrastructure and natural environment outcomes. People and communities are at the heart of everything you do. Absolutely. And December seems to have come around very quickly. So since joining the agency in May, what has been your focus and where are things up to in rec the recovery stage? The three big priorities, Lydia, when I came into the role were recovery, recovery, recovery. Mm. They are still the three big priorities. Yes, we're setting up the new organisation and we're, we're getting a lot of governance and structure and other things in place. But our primary focus, our eye on the ball, is to help communities recover because we've seen disruption, we've seen dislocation, we've seen tragedy and despair like we've never seen before. And whilst we've seen all that, we've also seen this extraordinary um, dominance of humanity, of community spirit, of volunteerism at the community level, helping uh, with that recovery and that rebuilding and that regeneration and indeed the healing of communities everywhere. And, and whilst communities have been affected and, and impacted by similar or related events, everybody's experience is different. Everybody's individual journey is different. Everybody's, every local community is different. What is a priority in one area is of a different priority in another area. I think I was talking to you off, offline just a little bit earlier and, and even today, I was down in Cabargo this morning catching up with, with people down there and in the re local relief centre, uh, we're coming up to the 12 month anniversary of the fire that hit Cabargo on New Year's Eve. There are people coming forward this week for the first time to say, I'm ready to have a conversation around what assistance is available. And we're seeing that right across the state. So everybody's journey is different. Everybody's experience is different. Mm. Everybody's ability to process the enormity of the challenge and the impact is different. So we've got to make sure that our, our systems, our, our programs, our supports are flexible enough and nuanced enough to be able to accommodate individuals, ind independent businesses, community profiles, all those sorts of things. We need to be able to connect uh, as is necessary and is, as is prioritised by those local communities. I hear you talk a lot about local communities and community-led solutions as well to not only being prepared but also in terms of understanding what are the assets in the communities yes. and how they can respond. So your focus on communities obviously is the starting point. So can you tell us more about that particular approach? Because from what I understand, you're actually dealing with multi-stakeholders, um, state governments, national governments, you're dealing with industry and business, but you very much focus on community as a strength. So Absolutely. what have you found in terms of community responses and how does that govern part of the recovery phases and the priorities within that phase? 
So, so look, I'm a, very, I'm a really strong believer in the best led anything is that which is locally led. So mm -hmm. the local planning, the local preparation, the local response, but then also the local recovery. And, and at that locally led um, uh, philosophy, we need states and national bodies to make sure they're supporting and they're facilitating and they're enabling and they're empowering um, local communities, local leaders to be able to do the things that matter that are of priority and that are considered necessary by that local community. Um, don't get me wrong, we are seeing a record amount of, of investment in, in monies, in programs, in systems, but they're only as good as their applicability at the local level. So, so being able to connect with and engage with local communities, principally through local governments, local councils and community leaders. Um, uh, uh, and, and I would say to you, in any community, think about something that works well, doesn't matter what it is, I'm willing to bet you uh, that it's underpinned by volunteers. Mm. Uh, volunteers in that local community, whether it's our education system, our care system, our sports and recreation, our environmental or land care services, and of course our fire and emergency services, volunteers are at the heart of all those things that are important and matter at the community level. So making sure we're buying in community volunteers into that local process is really important. Just in the last, just in the last um, couple of months, um, in, the, in 2020, uh, New South Wales alone, four, four and a half billion, just under four and a half billion dollars worth of bushfire recovery programs, pri primarily with the state, but also matched with the Commonwealth. Then we've got charity organisations and donated programs on top of that, pulling together local risk uh, recovery and, re and resilient committees at the local level to oversee and make sure we're capturing the thoughts and the feelings and the priorities of communities is fundamental to delivering what matters on the ground. And I can assure you, what is a priority in one community is not the same priority in another community, uh, and we've got to make sure that we're flexible enough and we're agile enough and we're able to have the policy frameworks flexible enough to be able to accommodate that difference and that need. It really, really matters. So I'm assuming when you say that, that not all communities are on par at this stage. Obviously, there's probably lots of different stages of development. Do you see as part of the future recovery response and, and really the solutions that communities will become very actively engaged in building those solutions or at least having a sense of how their community can respond? Yeah, I think they are already, Lydia. I, I think that's what we're seeing at the local level. And and depending on where I go, whether it's the north of the state, you know, the, the mid coast, the, the south area like I was down there this morning, the local the local community leaders and teams coming together, channeling their advice and their feedback in through council, in through local committees, or indeed in direct response to call for call for proposals and priorities from communities around what matters, what are the key projects that matter, what are the key small projects, large projects, uh, low cost, no cost things that matter, right through to significant you know, multi-million dollar investments at that local level that will be important for that community to help them on their recovery, their rebuilding and their healing journey out of what's been unfolding in the last 18 months. So, so they are tied in, they're, they're going direct to government but they're also going and sharing uh, with their community to make sure they got the priorities right. And, and in some areas, the priority might be get the school back up and running as the first priority, get the local community hall up and running, make sure the pub's operational because people want to have a, a gathering place to meet and talk and and um, and connect and, and have a good feed. And, and another area, all they wanted was a big lean-to on the side of the local fire station so they could put a community barbecue there because now that's the meeting point to keep track of progress and make sure their priorities are still the same and whether they need to, to readjust them. So they, they meet periodically. There's a couple mm. of phases you won't find me using out of the last 12 months or so. One of them is black summer bushfires mm. because people were being impacted and devastated by bushfires right outside the summer period, winter, spring. We were losing lives in spring. So it certainly isn't black summer bushfires for New South Wales. Yes, they intensified, but not exclusively. And the second phrase that I won't use is social distancing. Yes, I understand the basis of it, I understand the genesis of it, and it's absolutely fundamentally important. But what the narrative is requiring is physical distancing, spatial distancing, to make sure we're separated mm. to stop the transmission of this hideous, hideous virus. And more now than ever, I think, uh, social connectedness, social inclusion, reaching out for one another, looking out for one another is more important than ever. So, so the last thing we want is to exacerbate loneliness or depression or isolation. So being connected and, 
and, and making sure we take the time to reach out and tie in. We might do it a bit differently, but there might not be the same number of, of handshakes and hugs, but certainly uh, being connected and, and, and hooking up with each other is really, really important. I think that's really important. And it, um, we'll just take another question, but it will also talk about healing because I think that connection is actually what makes community and affirms us. We have another question from Brett Levy in Brisbane. There are literally tens of thousands of local cultural stories that scaffold our cultural connections to the land and connect us to our communities. How can we creatively facilitate the truth telling inherent within these majority of stories in an agile, effective and culturally appropriate manner using creative means and mediums to do so? Thank you. That's a nice segue into, I think, a consideration about how creativity connects us for the truth telling and storytelling. The stories that we tell each other as human beings, the way that we actually express how we are responding to situations, our dreams, our aspiration. I think in terms of healing, certainly there've been lots of examples of communities that have actually express themselves and articulating what their responses have been to trauma. What have you found in some of those examples? Uh, I think it's I think it's just so fundamental uh, and 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 like our First Nations people have done you know for uh, for years um, storytelling capturing artifacts at the time imagery um, 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 being able to display that because you're capturing memories in time. Mm. And as I travel around New South Wales uh, during the fires and particularly now uh, in the recovery process, uh, the ability for, for um, communities at a local level to capture their stories and share their stories uh, is fundamentally important. And the arts are just a, a cornerstone to that. Uh, in the last few weeks alone, um, or the last few months, uh, I've been up the north coast to the to the National Cartoon Gallery, for example, where where they did this beautiful display uh, of of all the cartoonists that were that were taught that were reporting the stories of the fires and how they were unfolding and what was being captured at moments in time, uh, whether it was to do with our wildlife or people displaced or people homeless or losing, you know, it didn't matter, but, but the images were a moment in time that were captured and they were put on display and there were, there were copies made so that people could keep those artefacts and share those artefacts and tell their stories. I was down, I was down in Braidwood only a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Braidwood Regional Arts Group and and help them open their art exhibition and and a book that oh. they published. It was it was art beautiful. On fire. Art on fire. Yes. You've seen it. And yes. and what I really loved about that was Maggie and the team there, uh, President Maggie and the team there. They invited known artists in the local community, but non-artists in the community, to pull their to pull their creativity together mm. to capture to capture moments that reflected how they were feeling, what they were thinking, uh, what they remember during the fires and how their journey of recovery was going. And whether that was a painting or a picture uh, or, a, or a card or something in writing or poetry or a song um, uh, or something that they made that were, that were artifacts left from the fire that they put together to tell a story about what had happened and just spending a couple of hours with them on the night. Uh, one of the fellows played on his, he, he strummed the guitar and and played this beautiful song that he created reflecting on the time of the story. So you've got this, you've got this arts group that came together. They've, they've put this beautiful exhibition together in the local um, um, art, art facility down there. Mm. But they've put it into a publication and they're sharing it. It's a moment in time. It's, it's, it's our history being created page by page because people have taken the time. But something so more powerful than that was catching up with the people on the evening, this is only Friday a week ago, mm. um, emotions are still very raw. The emotional and psychological repair and healing is very real. And for people to be able to come together and share their stories, one of the most powerful things I've seen over and over again in, 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 school lit, in, in, in materials that come from school kids or, or, or displayed on the wall there in, in Braidwood or elsewhere is commonly the, the phrase that says, you are not alone. I am not alone, we are not alone. And I think that says a lot about what people, are, what people are thinking and feeling, if you know what I mean. Mm. And then this morning, uh, I, was, I was down at Cabargo. I, I, I was able to go down to the local Cabargo public school, uh, catch up with 
uh, with Mr Kerr and the Year 5, 6 students uh, because they've done this beautiful book, they've worked on it over the, over the last year um, and the Year 5 and 6 students, they did a compilation. They, they, so the, I went to see the kindy kids, I went to see the Year 1 kids and the 3, 4 kids and they've all done their own books, pictures, images, drawings, um, uh, words, just beautiful simple words um, and there's something very beautiful about the rawness uh, of kids and their ability to share what they're thinking and how they're feeling and what happened to them or what happened to their family, what happened to their community, but also how they're feeling in the recovery, what they're grateful for, their praise and admiration for their local volunteer firefighters and their mums and dads and their nans and pops in the community. There's something just really powerful and beautiful and, and innocent about it, which I think will resonate with everybody. And, and they went and saw their local uh, Indigenous leaders in the area and they they, they spoke about the right name for fire and they've, they've named the fire. I, I, the names escape me, I'm sorry. Um, but, but I think the, the ability to connect and really think that through and, and it's, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the book is, you know, the day, the day she stole the sun, I think it was, because that fire was behaving at two, three and four in the morning when mm. fires are usually quiet, like you see fires behave at two, three and four in the afternoon. And as the sun rose, it didn't break through. The fire was of such a magnitude and scale that they lost their sunshine on on, on New Year's Eve. Uh, so, so things like that of very cathartic, um, uh, very important for the for the kids, but really powerful for the teachers and the carers and the and the mums and dads that are that are talking to their kids about what they're experiencing. And look, they lost loved ones, they lost family, they lost neighbours, uh, they lost livestock, they lost livelihoods, they lost homes. Uh, but they, they are grateful for each other and they've supported each other and they've really come together to put this beautiful publication together. I find it extraordinary that they have personalised the fire the day she took the sun or the day she stole the sun. I guess we are all um, cognisant of those images that were screened into our lounge rooms in relation to the fire. It, it is extraordinary that the aspect of being able to express that has come through music and dance and poetry and song and and actually telling the story being able to give it that expression there's been a lot of mental health obviously that has risen both during the time of the fires but also during covid for part of the programs that you're running in relation to hearing healing we we still realize that it's going to take some people a while to be able to articulate what that means. How are those programs going to assist people to really be able to put their lives back together and, and feel strengthened? How can they be resilient? I think it's fundamental to be able to talk. And I'll, I'll do, one of the most concerning conversations I had was only a matter of a month or so ago. I rang a former colleague in the RFS on the way home late one night. And it was an emotional conversation. Uh, there was tears at both ends of the phone call. We were, we were reflecting on a particularly traumatic event during the fires. And partway through the conversation, he indicated to me that he'd gone to get some professional help and he said it was really making a difference. And I said, mate, I'm really proud of you. That's great. We've talked about this for a while. I'm so pleased to hear. I said, what's it doing for you? He said, I am finding it much better. I'm getting along with my wife better. The kids are we're getting along better. I'm doing much better with my volunteers and my teams at work. And I said, that's great. I'm really proud of you. Keep going. He said, I will. And then we went to finish the conversation. And he said, can you do me a favour though, Shane? Can you promise not to tell anyone? I said, tell anyone what? And he said, I need you to promise to not to tell anybody that I'm getting help. And I was really deflated. I said, what do you mean? Mm. And he said, well, I don't want people to judge me. And my plea to everybody uh, in these fire affected communities, in this, in this year of such challenge and uncertainty, uh, trauma, uh, tragedy, um, uh, so much despair, we've seen the very best in people, but we're all affected, we are all humans. And I would just say to people, I would plead to people, talk with family, loved ones, colleagues, mates, and for goodness sake, put your hand up for a bit of assistance. If you and I went in for shoulder surgery uh, to get our shoulders reconstructed, 
and you're out on the tennis court in, a, in six weeks' time and I'm still getting a bit of physio for another four weeks, no one's going to think anything of me. Mm. So why is it different when it comes to our emotional and psychological well-being? We've got to normalise this conversation that it's OK not to be OK, but it's also OK to be OK. Uh, and the, the images that keep coming through in all the arts groups that I travel around and see, I receive thousands of cards in my role as Commissioner of the RFS and, and over and over again, I am not alone, you are not alone, we are not alone, we are not alone in the way that we've been troubled or upset or challenged by what we've seen, what we've experienced and what we're trying to process as individuals. So please have a conversation, reach out to one another, give people around you the permission to know that it's okay not to be okay and through talking and sharing it really helps. And through these arts groups, through these community meetings, that is one of the most powerful signals that's come through and even at my meeting at Braidwood only only a couple of weeks ago and again at Cabago this morning catching up with volunteers and the school group, talking with each other and sharing their thoughts and feelings really helps individuals, really helps communities on their journey to that, to that recovery and, and coming out the other side better and stronger. How do you think we'll look as a nation that is resilient? Because we are always going to face these extremes, I think you called it. It's not going to go away. And in doing so, because you're now in such a major decision-making role, coordinating so many uh, disaster management services, what do you think the role of arts and creativity can play so that as a nation we become a resilient nation? Because we have to be. It's, we're taking stock of the history of our practices, the type of environment we've got, the changing climates, and we are faced with really a conundrum about how the decisions we make today will really lay the foundations for future generations so that they are extremely resilient and able to respond, but also understand very deeply what is the nature of all of us living here. That's a really big question. I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, but you know what, and, and necessarily so, because what I, I, I would answer it in, in, in a multifaceted way. So I think, I think through the arts, there's a couple of really big sobering reminders out of the last 12 to 18 months. We owe it to everybody impact and, and, and impacted and affected out of the events of the last 12 months to make sure we never forget. So the best thing we can do is capture thoughts, feelings, experiences and events in a very meaningful way. Our First Nations of people have done it for, for, for thousands and thousands of years. We've got to continue to do it so we don't forget. So that when we're reflecting back on what happened in, you know, not 2019, 2020, there are stories, there are images there. And most importantly, there are the thoughts and feelings of those people that were living it and experiencing it captured somewhere, somehow. And one of the one of our callers online talked about, you know, different ways of digitising and, and being able to share and empower people through that experience is really important. I think the second thing is COVID has really reminded us, has reminded us all of how important the arts is uh, to uh, our wellbeing, uh, our social and economic well-being as a community, as a state, as a nation. And I think like, like anything when it comes to building resilience is being open to the fact that we are vulnerable and susceptible to things disrupting the way we live and the way we work and the way we operate. But it's our ability to foresee and anticipate the likelihood of those disruptions and ready ourselves ready ourselves individually, ready ourselves as, as communities, as industries, uh, as a state, as a nation. And then when those things do happen and, and we are challenged, that we've got the capacity to adapt and adjust and modify the way we're doing things, to seize the opportunity, to seize the moment to do things smarter, to do things differently, but not lose the core of what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And I think getting back to that phrase that I talked about a little while ago, I hate that phrase, social distancing. Mm. Uh, it's about physical distancing. But what community is, what, what, what love and connection is all about, is being able to connect and socialise um, uh, and join up uh, with family and loved ones and colleagues uh, and take benefit in, in music, in theatre, in cinema, uh, uh, in, in the ability to see the creativity 
uh, that resides in our community that captures moment in time, moments in time and reflects on thoughts and feelings. So the arts has proven that if we can make sure we are resilient in what we do and the way we do it, we're better able to withstand the knocks and the bumps and the big emergencies that will come our way into the future. But most importantly, we will come out the other side uh, and, we, and we will adjust and adapt and be renewed and be better and be stronger as a result of that disruption or that, or that event. And I think we are seeing that absolutely uh, in the events that we've seen over the last 12 months, 18 months. It's been a, it's been a period of time like, like no other in my lifetime. Mm. Um, but what I've, what I've seen in the adversity, in the, in the tragedy, in the despair and the, and the anguish, I've seen this extraordinary dominance uh, of community spirit, of humanity that has outshone the darkness, that, that's been able to pull people together. You know, love and compassion and care and consideration. It, it has overwhelmed me in terms of how wonderful um, the people of New South Wales are, how wonderful our fellow Australians are. And indeed, during our darkest of times during the bushfires, the generosity and support and care that came from from, from overseas, you know, people really gave and gave enormously, whether it was providing a, a room for the night to someone who's now homeless because they've lost everything or don't know whether they can get back to their home and it's still going to be there, through to the provision of goods and materials, donating of their time and energy to make a difference or the generosity through fundraising. We've seen some pretty wonderful people rise uh, and like I've seen through recovery meetings and recovery groups, the kids at Cabago School today, uh, the Bragg, the, the Braidwood Regional Arts Group, the teams up the North Coast, Mid Coast, you know, local towns and local communities are putting on arts festivals and arts programs to get people to come together to do things. And ultimately, it's a good excuse to have a chat and just see how people are going. It really matters. Great. I'm going to come back to you um, towards the end. But uh, our final question for the evening, it's from Sophie Travers in Melbourne. <laughs> Hello, my question is about the pace of recovery. In this first period, uh, as we respond to the effects of COVID-19, many of the grants and schemes that we've been delivering have been about a quick response. And I'm wondering how we ensure that artists and communities who think more slowly and possibly more profoundly are not gonna be left behind as we distribute resources that's a that's a wonderful question and the simple answer is this that yes there's a there's a need to distribute funding and programs and support in the immediacy uh, following an event or a disruption but so many of the programs are designed uh, to be rolled out over the months and years following the major disruption and even I can say off the top of my head, we've got, we've got just over $4 billion, $4.5 billion nearly, just in bushfire recovery alone. Hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars has already gone out uh, in, in direct grants and, different, and direct support programs. But there's also this extraordinary body of work and dedicated funding uh, that can provide for local economic recovery, local community um, resilience and rebuilding programs, uh, recovery programs uh, that can enable people to, to implement those programs over the next few years. I think the other important thing, Lydia, listening to that question from our, from our last person there, is that everybody's journey is different. Even down in Cabago this morning, we're about to hit the anniversary uh, in a couple of weeks' time of when the fire hit that town. I was talking to somebody that, that works in the relief centre down there, and this week someone has come forward for the first time since being affected by the fires to say, I'm ready to have a conversation around what assistance is there for me. Up the north coast, well and truly beyond 12 months after they've been impacted by fires, people are coming forward to say, I've heard about this assistance thing, I know you've been offering it for a long time, but I'm now ready to have that conversation. Where do I start, what can I do? So we've deliberately got to make sure that not all the money goes out in the immediacy after the impact or after the event or after the disaster, but making sure we've got the programs and the funding dedicated to help people on what is going to be a, a long and considerable uh, difficult journey. It's extraordinary in terms of people understanding where they're at to ultimately say, I think I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And that personal journey is also, I think, anybody who's been through that trauma has themselves have to find that inner well of strength. <clears throat> I'm just gonna ask you, Shane, you've been extraordinary in terms of being able to support a community and a nation to recover. What do you yourself 
look to to find your inner well of strength? I've looked to a number of things in the last year or so. Uh, first and foremost, in my role as Commissioner of the RFS, it was the members, it was the volunteers uh, and the salaried members of the RFS and all the fire and emergency services that no matter how difficult, no matter how deflating the conditions got, day after day, week after week, their commitment, their dedication, their tenacity, their ability just to turn up day after day in their thousands doing their very best and sadly a number paid the ultimate price in that service to community. But I've also been uplifted by the extraordinary community response, the way communities have responded to the uncertainty, to the tragedy, to the, to the fear of what was unfolding around them. And as we've moved into COVID, to see us dealing with something, particularly early on in the year, that we didn't know a lot about collectively. Mm. We were learning as we went. But to see a considered, to see a patient, uh, to, to see a patient considered, decisive community responding to the expert advice, whether it was fires, whether it was COVID, people understood the significance. They understood the gravity of what was unfolding and to do their part to make sure we were saving and protecting as many people as possible was really uplifting. I think for me, that inspires me, that keeps me going to see volunteerism, to see volunteers, men and women, um, and communities impacted and affected doing their very best. And to be able to be a part of something that every day I know I've got teams of people that are just giving of themselves for the want of making a positive difference uh, in the community. That's what their focus is. That's pretty special to be a part of. And I always look around, if I think I'm having a bad day and it's a legitimate bad day, I always think about who else is having an even tougher one. Uh, so I maintain a bit of perspective. I've got a wonderful family. I've got a wonderful support network. They keep me very grounded. When I walk in the door at home, I'm in charge of nothing. Uh, and, and heaven help me if I try to be. Um, so, so it is about mm. keeping real. And I think it is also remembering in whatever leadership role we've got, it's always about other people. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. You've got to look after yourself and that sort of thing. But ultimately, it's your team. It's your, it's your men and women that are doing their very best to make a difference. It's all those that are affected that need the support and need the assistance, that's what keeps me voted, motivated, that's what keeps me going. And absolutely, community is at the heart of that. And I think we are very blessed in New South Wales in Australia to have a wonderful sense of community where there is this sense of mateship, where there is this sense of wanting to make a difference and look out for each other. And balancing that up, we've just got to make sure that people don't carry too much themselves mm. and acknowledge that it is okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to put your hand up for a bit of assistance every now and then, particularly given what we've been through in the last 12 months or so. And what do you think as a nation we can, in terms of writing our story, what, what will be something that we understand ourselves through all of this? That together we can achieve. I, I, think, I think despite the challenges, despite the adversity, despite the trauma and the tragedy and the dislocation to so much of what we do that we take for granted, our, our inability to travel, our inability to, to be connected with. I mean, the natural instinct is to share hugs and, and, and share handshakes. To not do that is really confronting, is really mm. difficult. Um, but I think together, when we know and understand the issues, when we know and understand the facts as best as we can, by crikey, as a nation, we can do wonderful things. When we've seen our people innovate and adapt and adjust, when we've seen our governments collaborate and connect together, provide that political leadership and authority uh, using expert advice and guidance that we needed in times of crisis, I think speaks volumes of a wonderfully democratic, free nation uh, that together as one, we can and do achieve great things, particularly in the face of adversity. So for me, I'm immensely proud uh, to, be, to be part of the New South Wales community. I'm very proud to be an Australian, particularly given what we've seen and experienced in this last 12 or 18 months, but the way in which we've responded, the way we've adapted, and the way we're still coming through uh, those extraordinary and terrible events, I think is something we should all be very proud of. And I think we are in many ways uh, the envy of the globe. That's fantastic, thank you so much. Um, inspirational. Shane, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been absolutely a journey through what has been an extraordinary year. And I, I think we don't always fathom it, but you've articulated it beautifully. Thank you to everyone who has joined us. And this is the final episode 
of In Conversation 2020. It's been three illuminating conversations and you can rewatch any of these on the Australia Council's website or our Facebook page. And feel free to share. Take care and we look forward to continuing the conversation in 2021.